Welcome to the Abyssinian syllabary, where we spell out Ethiopia in 33 characters. I'm Yves Marie Stranger, your host and the compiler of these Abyssinian lives. Nota bene. While any resemblance to actual countries, past or present, and to historical figures is not purely coincidental, this is a work of fiction. For a primer on these Ethiopian characters, newcomers may start with the prologue by Manuel de Goes. To order the book or a poster of the Abyssinian syllabary, visit Ethiopia.com. That's U T H I O P I A dot com. I do not like returning on my footsteps, said the master, placing, as usual, one foot in front of the another. However, I must hasten to add the proviso that just as there can be no tale without a retelling, neither can there be any pleasure without some back and forth. And the master plodded on, placing one foot after the other. The Apocrypha of Zereyakob Sylvia Pankhurst Puh. Sylvia was a suffragette by dynastic succession. Even before her birth, she participated in demonstrations, kicking concurrently to the clamoring of women claiming their right to vote from the Downing Street railings to the Epsom races. Sylvia was there, cocooned by her mother's womb, when Emily Davison sacrificed her life to the cause of universal suffrage, trampled underfoot by the swiftest racehorses in the kingdom on the well-tended turf of the track, even though it is not true that these lawns were tended to by armies of gardeners equipped with scissors, neither is it true that these same gardeners, who did not even exist, were sent out as soon as Ms. Davison had been spirited away to straighten one by one the blades of grass the suffragette had crushed with her lifeless body. Such tales are to be expected, once one has been elevated to modern sainthood. If, as the Ethiopian proverb holds, it is the grass that is trampled underfoot when elephants pick a quarrel, Sylvia continued to be heedless of the dangers of sticking her neck out. Sylvia grew up in a household where the daily fare on the dinner table was decided in a secret ballot, in which even the domestic help took part. Susie, the cook, Anarcho syndicalism faction, always voted for easy dishes, such as bovril consommé and bleu mange, while Sylvia always cast her lot for homemade gelato and meringue. So elaborate, so time-consuming, oh, so flavoursome, these recipes. Susie secretly thought the lass a crypto-bourgeois and slightly elitist for these tastes, and we can see that her insight was prescient. Despite this, neither Susie nor Sylvia prevailed more often in these votes in which all of the lodgers of the Pankhurst anarchist freehold participated. Sylvia's mother, Emmeline, put these culinary elections to good use to spell out to Sylvia the machinations of parliamentary democracy. An efficient campaigner before all else, Emmeline died the same year universal suffrage was, at last, consented to the female of the species in 1928. Women had been granted the right to be elected to Parliament after the First World War, and in acknowledgement of the efforts consented by the women folk of this kingdom for its liberation. But the common women still had to wait till 1928 to cast a vote. Sylvia, born into a dynasty, was to Sylvia, born into a dynasty, was to form a total aversion to universal suffrage from these early experiences in democracy in the family kitchens. It was this same war which finally gave a voice to women that provided Sylvia 
a socialist, an avowed anarchist and early anti-fascist agitator, the platform she had always so craved, a kitchen where she had her hand on the gas dial and was not reduced to the role of lazy Zanzu. She first heard the voice of the lithe emperor, the pocket king, as the fascists derided him, on the Fidelitone, in the kitchen, of course. The BBC broadcast the speech the Abyssinian was giving at the Tribune of the Society of Nations in Geneva. The voice of the emperor was fast covered by the English translation and by the voice of the Italian delegates who contrived to cover the proud man's speech with chosen insults from their country. Sylvia found herself fascinated by the words of this incantation, which, it seemed to her, were redolent with the accents of antiquity and possessed a beguiling appeal she could not place and was to her ears the auditory embodiment of a steaming cake pulled out from the oven. One week later, the workers' dreadnought seized publication, and the first issue of a newspaper exclusively focused on the cause of Abyssinian independence rolled out of the presses. The New Times and Ethiopian News the broadsheet was to prove the ideal propaganda vehicle for the cause of Ethiopian independence. Here you could read weekly interviews with the meddlesome emperor himself. After the lukewarm reception given to his Geneva speech, His Majesty is more or less under house arrest in a Georgian mansion in the city of Bath. His cause needs all the support it can get. The Ethiopian News publishes tales of brave Abyssinian resistance offset by dastardly Italian maneuvers. These articles of faith, often composed by Americans whose sole knowledge of the country is sourced from a few Sundays spent in the Ethiopian Hebrew Beta Kudus Congregation of America. Here, a messianic cult, a precursor of Rastafarianism, dedicates itself to the Negro dynast of a distant holy land. When the winds of history change course in East Africa, the British are compelled to return to the throne, the pocket emperor, which they do, but without excessive enthusiasm. Sylvia Pankhurst, suffragette and socialist, is invited to tour the kingdom of Abyssinia, Granted honorary Ethiopian citizenship, Sylvia establishes herself in the country that she makes her home and begins to write history books. In these works, the Ethiopian kings are gallant and ardent knights, while their adversaries, Portuguese Jesuits, Turkish jihadists, the perfidious English, never fail to renege on their promises but never prevail against the inevitable progress of the holy kings of Ethiopia. When Sylvia passes away, a national funeral is given in Addis Ababa's Trinity Cathedral. Sylvia reposes not far from the tomb of the royal family, where sleep for all eternity the emperors of old Abyssinia, to whom she devoted her last years. In today's Federal Republic of Ethiopia, an army of Ethiopian gardeners continues to tend to this cemetery, mindful that the blades of grass always be equal. The motive being that Ethiopia is today, after all, a democracy. And this is how Sylvia Pankhurst, the daughter of a suffragette, a suffragette herself, and an anti-imperialist militant transformed herself into a passionaria of Abyssinian independence and became a monarchist icon.